for a lot of the node stuff, I'm going to use the, the my iPad here, and uh, this is sort of a live PDF document that will, um, uh, I'll put a link to it on Canvas, and the same link will work. So if you go back to the link tomorrow, it'll have everything, like, as I write, it synchronizes, uh, which is kind of handy. So uh, I'll put the link there, and then you don't have to, I mean, if you download it, obviously, you'd have to re-download it. But if you look at it live on Dropbox, then it'll be, um, uh, it'll update to whatever the most recent version is. Uh, okay, so let's uh, let's spend today going through some algebra review stuff, uh, just to make sure we clean up some cobwebs that you guys have probably forgotten. Um, and let's just say start with uh, stuff involving lines. Um, all right, so what are the equation? Uh, ways that we can write the uh, equation of a line. There's a couple different ways, yeah. Yeah, that's sort of the classic, the uh, slope-intercept form. Okay, what's another way? Yeah, yeah, point-slope, which is, yeah, I mean, whatever you call the point, right? So uh, that form we're actually going to use quite a bit because uh, as we'll see you know, when we do a bunch of calculus stuff, uh, in many situations we know the point and we know the slope, and this form is sort of perfect for that. Um, okay, so here the, the coordinates of the point would be x sub 0, y sub 0. Um, those would be known coordinates of, you know, with numbers, and then m obviously is the slope. Um, good question, why do we use the letter m for slope? because slope totally has the letter M in it? We have no idea. Like, I know it, so those of you who know me know that I'm, one of the things I'm interested in is math history. And um, so I have a bunch of math history friends. We have no clue um, why M for slope. So anyway, um, any more than we do X for meaning the unknown, right? So, uh, yeah. Uh, and then there's one other form that you occasionally see. Uh, it's not particularly handy in calculus, or at least first semester calculus, but it can be really handy in higher level classes, um, which would be something like this, uh, AX plus BY equals C, or uh, something along those forms. Uh, and Often, if you guys see AX plus BY equals C, the first thing you do is convert it into one of the other two forms so that you can actually get your hands on it. Uh, but, th but that form turns out to be kind of handy uh, in some uh, sort of specialized circumstances. So uh, those are sort of the three basic versions that you'll, you'll see it in. And uh, just so that we remind ourselves, what is slope? How do you compute slope for a line? Yeah, it's just rise over run, right? So if you have, you know, some two points like this, and let's say that this is x naught, y naught, and let's say that that's x1, y1, then the slope would be the difference of the y coordinates over the corresponding difference in the x coordinates, right? Um, <clears throat> uh, does it matter what order you do the subtraction in? Uh, not as long as you do both of them in the same order, right? If you've got the order flipped, you'll get the negative of what you're supposed to. But um, I usually do the the rightmost point minus the leftmost point, and that, that sort of is good enough. Um, and since this is kind of the first day, everything, I'm writing big enough, the screen is sufficiently visible. Yeah, we're good, okay. Um, so, uh, right, okay, so obviously then, what's the problem with uh, this, this slope formula, right? What could be an issue? Like what happens if x1 and x0 are the same? 
then I'd be dividing by, yeah, okay, which is bad. Okay, so if x1 equals x0, that's a situation where you have a vertical line, and the vertical line slope if you divide by zero, that's an undefined thing, so we just say the slope is undefined. You can kind of think of the slope as being either plus or minus infinity, right? So if you think of a line getting steeper and steeper and steeper, and then it sort of gets infinite, infinitely steep, uh, but strictly speaking, it's undefined. Um, okay, good. Uh, and then on the subject, if a vertical line has undefined slope, a horizontal line has zero, right? then, yeah, so that's just a, a horizontal line. Um, and if both of those quantities are equal to each other, then you have two copies of the same point, and does that define a line? Not uniquely, right? Because how many lines are there that go for a single point? Pick a point. How many lines go through it? As many as you want, right? So that's not enough. You need two points, obviously, to, to do this. Okay, so does that, that all ring a bell? Ding, ding. Okay. Um, all right, so on the subject of slope, let's talk about perpendiculars and parallels. Parallel lines have the same slope, whatever that slope happens to be. Right. And they would just go through different points. Uh, and then, wh obviously, what does the word parallel mean, like in a geometric sense? Yeah, they never intersect. You keep drawing them, they, they stay that fixed distance apart forever. Okay. Um, what about perpendiculars? So... So let's suppose L1 has slope M1. And so let's say that capital L1 is a, a line with a particular slope. And L2 has slope M2. Then what's true about M1 and M2? Yeah. So there's a couple ways you can say it. That would be one way. This would be another way. Or that's a third way. Those are all equivalent expressions, obviously. Um, but the perpendiculars, right, if you take the two slopes and you multiply them, you'll get negative one. Uh, the negative reciprocal kind of view is, is often how we use it, right? Because often you know one slope and you want to find the other one, and so that's how you would solve for it, right? Uh, is it just enough to reciprocal it? No. Is it just enough to negate it? No. It's got to be both of them. Okay. Um, and you guys remember that, right? Uh, just out of curiosity, because um, I, I – I mean, some of you guys have written about this in your autobiography, but uh, all right, of the freshmen in the room, what math class, well, did uh, did you guys take in high school your senior year? Who was in stats of some sort, okay? What about calculus of some sort, okay? What about, like, pre-calc or trig of some sort, okay? Um, those of you who aren't freshmen, uh have you taken any other math classes here? Yeah. 108, right, okay, for uh, computer science. Uh, any others? No? Okay. Uh, so those of you who are not freshmen, what did you guys take senior year of high school? Anybody take calculus then? Yeah, okay. Uh, Pre-calc or trig? What about stats? Yeah, okay. Um, so... We we got some cobwebs to clear out. Yeah, a little bit. Okay. Sorry. Um, 
Okay, good. So, uh, right. Uh, so the perpendicular slopes. And let me go back to my notes here. Okay, so any questions on that? Um, on what we've got so far, the line stuff. Okay, uh, the last thing would be, what's the, uh, you guys mind if I go to a new page? Is that okay? okay. Um, what are the definitions of intercept? So what is an x-intercept? It's wherever a what? Yeah, a line or possibly a curve, right? We'll cross the x-axis. So, and you cross the x-axis whenever y is equal to zero, right? Uh, and, of course, this is why you don't do math at 4 in the morning, because at 4 in the morning, what do you say instead? You say x equals 0. It's the x-axis. And then you don't catch yourself. I don't know. Maybe we should equally not do calculus at 8 in the morning. What do you think, Jaden? Yeah? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, right. Now, what about the y-intercept? That'd be sort of the, the corresponding other case whenever x is zero. Uh, does a given curve or line have to have uh, both or either uh, intercept? No, it's completely, well, a straight line uh, will have to intersect at least one of the axes, right? If you just think about the geometry, it sort of has to. But a curve need not intersect either of them, right? Um, it just depends, obviously, on the equation. Okay, um, good. So, right, so quick review of lines. Uh, any other questions on that? This hopefully is familiar and just, like I said, cobweb cleaning, basically. All right, let's say that I have this. What do I have to do? Or actually, you know what? Let me simplify it for right this instant. We'll do that one in a second. Okay. If any of you guys ever write the following. That is wrong. That's wrong. Ah. Okay. All right. Why is it wrong? What do you have to do? Yeah, you got to foil it, right? So you think of it as, and then what is this? X squared plus XY plus YX plus Y squared, right? And then... What can you do with the x, y's, Jaden? Yeah. Okay. So um, <clears throat> this error, the thing I wrote in red there, is so frequently seen on calculus papers that we stuffy mathematicians have a name for it. It's called the freshman's dream. Because, like, if I had a nickel for every time I've seen that on a on a paper. Uh, and I invested that, those nickels wisely, I could retire tomorrow and be a very wealthy man, right, and live on a mansion in California on the beach and, you know, have, you know, a 20-car garage like Jay Leno and, uh, yeah, and not teach calculus for a living. So, um, anyway, uh, so... <clears throat> You know, I say that, and you're like, well, yeah, McKinney, like, quit yelling at us. We're not idiots. Okay, but you will all make that mistake at least once during.
during the, the, the course. And usually that mistake happens after midnight. So again, this is why you don't do math after midnight. Okay. Um, and uh, let's see. So what would be the opposite process of this, right? If I've got this in sort of this form and I multiply it out, okay, that's one thing. What's the other direction? What do we call that? It's not quite what I meant, sorry. I, I see what you mean, but yeah, that's not what I meant. So if I take something that's all jumbled up and I break it back into two different pieces, we call that factoring, okay? Um, yeah, now the square root thing would be what's the opposite of squaring something? How would you undo that process? You'd square root both sides, right? Uh, okay, so um, yeah, so factoring is, like I said, to go the other direction. And of course, which way is easier? Yeah, foiling it out is easy, right? You can teach monkeys to do that, right? Because it's an algorithmic process, you just do it. Right. Factoring, on the other hand, I mean, yeah, there are kind of some algorithms for it, but um, factoring, on the other hand, can be a little tricky in the sense that you've got like there's lots of different possible cases. Right. So let's just take an example of one and kind of see um, what what could happen. Right. So if I had, for example. Something like this. How would this factor? So what's the sort of game that you want to play here? Well, first off, I know it's going to be x plus or minus something in both positions, right? And how do I know that it's x for both of them? Because it's x squared, not 2x squared or something else like that, okay? Uh, and then... What do I want to do? I want to find two numbers that add up to negative 4, but that also multiply to equal positive 4. Okay? Uh, and how, so I need, um, I need to think of numbers that do that. Now, in many cases, partly because we deliberately designed these things so that they factor nicely, what's the solution in this case? Negative 2 for both numbers, right? Okay, because if I multiply them, I get 4 because I've got a double negative, right? And if I add them, I get negative 4, which is the coefficient of the linear term. And check, it works out. Okay, uh, but I sort of cherry-picked this example. Is that always going to neatly work out like that? No, which is, of course, a pain in the butt. Okay, so not always is something going to factor, okay, and sorry, or factor cleanly. Um, so when it comes to factoring, I usually give myself five seconds to do it. If I can't factor it within five seconds, I don't give up and say it's unfactorable, but I just stop doing this experimental method, right? If I can stare at it and get it within five seconds, which in many cases, right, you can, uh, then great. But how do you know it doesn't factor? Like, just because you've sat there for 10 minutes trying to figure out how it factors, does that guarantee that it doesn't actually factor? No, of course not. Maybe you just haven't seen the right numbers yet. Okay, but what's the foolproof way to do this and figure out whether or not it factors no matter what? Yeah, the quadratic formula. Okay, so what you'll notice here is that x squared minus 4x plus 4, if I set that equal to 0 and I solve this, what do I get as my answers? And I'm gonna write it twice for technical reasons that we'll deal with later, okay? Um, but I know that any time that I find a, an x-intercept, that's gonna to correspond to one of the factors, okay? So x minus two, each one of those gives me an x equals 2 fact, uh, uh, root, okay? And so I can go back and forth between roots and factors uh, in this way. All right, well, let's say that I had the most general quadratic equation possible, okay? 
And of course, it's not quadratic if a equals zero, so let's exclude that case. Right, because if a equals zero, we're dealing with something linear. We don't need anything fancy for that. Okay, so what's the what's the old quadratic formula? Did anybody learn the song when you were in school? Yeah, what's the song? Oh, I see. Okay, well, I'll do it. All right, so x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Yeah? Thank you. Thank you very much. No. <laughs> um, so, uh, did anybody learn a different song for it? No? How many of you were, like, insulted that I just sang that? So, I remember when I was in algebra, uh, and my teacher made us learn songs for things like that and um, other stuff that I was just, like, incensed. Like, why do I need a song to remember the quadratic formula? Like, come on, this is not rocket science. And then I became a teacher and found out how handy it is to have those kinds of tricks in your back pocket with students. So, yeah, anyway. Um, okay, so we remember that. Yeah. Um, and uh, obviously, all the pieces have to be in the correct position. Um, right, and so don't get the subtraction backwards or the whatever. So just you know, but you guys hopefully remember this. What is the thing underneath the square root called? So the the stuff that's inside the square root. Anybody happen to remember? No, it's called the discriminant. Okay, and why that's important is because the discriminant. There are three possible values that it could take on, right? It could be positive, it could be negative, or it could be zero. Okay, if it's positive, then what's true? How many answers do we have? Two, and they're different answers. If the discriminant is zero, how many answers do we get? It depends on how you want to count, right? But if the discriminant is zero, then what am I doing with this plus or minus thing? I'm adding and subtracting the exact same number. Okay, and so it's, I'm not getting a new number, but we'll sort of count it twice for, again, for technical reasons. Okay, um, and so actually this situation, the, the example that we worked here, uh, x squared minus 4x plus 4, that does have zero as a discriminant. Okay. So zero as a discriminant tells you when you've got one of these duplicated uh, answers, okay? Um, and then the third case is what happens if the discriminant is negative? Yeah, the solutions are imaginary, or they're complex numbers, okay? Now, uh, there's two ways that you can answer the question. So let's say that you were working one of these and the discriminant was in fact negative, okay? In this class, what would you say about the intercepts? You would say that they don't exist, right? Because the roots are imaginary numbers. So um, so I guess maybe what I should say is, uh, you can do calculus with complex numbers, but it's really fun and requires like three more classes before you'd be ready for it. Because it turns out to be really complicated. Okay, It's really cool, but it's, uh, really different too. Okay, so if the discriminant is negative, there's just no solution or no intercept or it's undefined or does not exist or however, you know, whatever word you would say that. Um, and we won't deal with complex numbers in the in the class. Okay, uh, Okay. good. Yeah. Um, what happens if you've got something bigger than a quadratic? Those get harder to factor. And there's tricks for that, um, but they're not necessarily all guaranteed to work. Okay, so here's maybe a good question. If I made a cubic version of this, so like ax cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus d, is there a general formula to solve for x? Is there a cubic version of the quadratic formula? So... 
I'm not asking what is the formula. I'm asking does it exist? Is there a formula out there someplace? Turns out yes. Okay, it's kind of complicated. Uh, what about fourth degree? So if I have ax to the fourth plus blah blah blah, is there a formula for that? Turns out yes. It's even more horrible. Um, and then the last case would be what about fifth degree? Turns out there is no general formula for one of those, and and we can prove why. Um, and obviously, if you can't do fifth degree, then you can't do higher than that. So, uh, yeah, these things get much, much, much more difficult to factor the, the higher the exponent is, uh, up to in including impossible. Okay. Um, another way to maybe think about this is that it turns out that polynomials and numbers have a lot of in, a lot in common in sort of a structural sense. Um, and if I take a polynomial, can I think about factoring it into little linear pieces? in the same way that I could take a really big number and think about factoring it into primes. Yeah? Well, is factoring a really big number easy or hard? Well, it depends, right? The bigger the number gets, the harder it gets, right? So if I hand you a 10-digit number, how do you know if it's prime or not? I mean, there's some tricks you can pull, right? Like if the last digit is an even number, then you know it's divisible by two. And then there's the whole thing about like, if you add up the digits and you get something that's a multiple of three, then you write all those little tricks. But is it guaranteed to be prime or not prime if you just stare at it? No. And you might have to do a whole lot of check-in just to find out it's prime. All right, so what if I hand you a hundred digit number and ask you if it's prime. We'll be here a while. Uh, and this is why it's safe to use your credit card on the internet, right? Because uh, it's hard to factor prime numbers. So anyway, um, okay, good. Now, let's do something completely different and go over to stuff that I guarantee you, you've all forgotten. Don't we all love logarithms? Yeah, okay. So if I have a to the b equals c, then the definition of the logarithm is as such, okay? If a to some power b equals some quantity c, then another way to say that is the logarithm of c is equal to uh, b, okay? Um, and here, what's the base of the logarithm? a, okay? Now, in practical, for practical purposes, what usually is the base? Or, One of those three numbers is usually what the base is going to be, okay? Um, and it, it turns out it doesn't really matter what the base is because you can always convert it. And we'll, I'll show you how to do that in a minute. Uh, but 10 or E would have been the, the two common ones that you would have dealt with in high school, okay? Uh, and one of the reasons that uh, – or sorry, because those are the two most common – uh, if you bust out your calculator, where are the logarithm buttons? How many log buttons are there? There's usually exactly two, one for base 10 and one for base E. If it's base E, what do we call it? The natural log, okay, and we would abbreviate it LN, okay? If you see log with no thing down at the bottom, no base, explicitly stated, what's the assumption? Usually it means base 10, okay? I say usually because uh, in advanced math or in Mathematica, 
it actually means base E. Uh, and in computer science books, often it means base 2. Okay, so the third case, those of you guys who want to study computer science, right, um, well, if you're doing everything in binary in computer science, then base 2 is kind of important, and so you tend to do the stuff base 2 in that case. Okay. Um, anyway, so it's going to be one of those three things most of the time, but not always. Um, and what happens if you want to compute a logarithm uh, base 7, but you don't have a log base 7 button on your calculator? It's okay. There's a conversion uh, formula. Okay, so does anybody happen to remember the change base law? So if I want to do log base B of A, I can change it to either base 2 or base E by just doing that. Okay, so take log of whatever base you choose of the inside and divide it by log of whatever the base was. Okay. Um, I've written here both the base 10 and the base E version because those, for practical purposes, are usually what you're converting to because those are the buttons you have in your calculator. Right. Um, once we get into the calculus, everything we'll do is base E. Okay, and there's good reasons why it makes the calculus work out really cleanly. Um, uh, but we'll get to that. Um, and so, yeah, so in most math classes, right, you're really doing it base E. Um, there's maybe some exceptions. So um, let's say, uh, was anybody in Scouts in high school, Boy Scouts? Did you ever learn any navigation? No? Okay. Well, that's sort of a dying art. Um, so preview of coming attractions. Um, hopefully next year we'll see. Uh, so if I stranded you on a boat in the middle of the ocean and I gave you a clock that was synchronized to Greenwich, England, a book that had uh, a, a thing called a nautical almanac, a slide rule, I don't even have to give you a slide rule, plenty of paper and a table of logarithms, could you figure out where you were on the planet? Oh, and I need to give you a sextant also. Yeah, you don't know how to do it, but if you did, you'd be like, oh, okay, no big deal. You'd wait for the sun to go down, you'd take some measurements, and uh, you could figure out where you were on the planet. Huh? Yeah, you know exactly where you were on the, well, not exactly, but you know within maybe a few nautical miles as to where you were, uh, which is pretty cool. So, anyway. Um, okay. So, right, uh, so let's, um, let's maybe review some of the rules here. Um, if I have two exponents next to each other, what happens? So a to the b times a to the c equals a to the b plus c, a to the b to the c, equals a to the bc. Okay, here's a way to remember that that you will never forget once I utter it. Exponents are like people. When they're next to each other, they add. When they're on top of each other, they multiply. Is it too early for humor? Good one. Okay. Um, that's like not quite dad jokes. It's it's not cheesy enough to be a dad joke. Yeah. So uh, anyway, yes. And again, you will mess this up at least once. So uh, just take heed now. All right. Now, on the logarithm side, there's sort of corresponding versions of this. All right. If I have log of a product of two numbers, That equals the sum of the logarithms. Okay. This is, in fact, why logarithms were invented, if you will, is precisely because they do this. Okay. Uh, 
And if you think about why, uh, let's say that you had two numbers and you want to multiply them. That's hard, right? Uh, like, and let's say you don't have a calculator. All you got is just a ream of paper and a pencil, right? And let's say that these two numbers have 10 decimal points each, right? They're really precise numbers. Do you want to sit down and multiply two numbers that have 10 decimal places each? Could you do it? Is it going to take a while? Yeah, it's going to be a pain in the butt, right? Whereas taking log of both sides means that you can just add the numbers and then you can undo the log at the end. Um, and so that's why logarithms got invented in the first place, uh, was precisely so you could do this. Now, the corresponding other case is if you had something like this, then the exponent just sort of pops out front. Is this, uh, we ringing a bell here? Yeah? Okay. Um, so those are um, sort of the, the beginnings of the, the exponent logarithm rules, okay? Um, now, there are some special cases because what happens if I have a to the zero? What's something raised to the zero power? One, okay? On the logarithm side, that's asking what's the log of one? In this case, it would be, or sorry, log of 1 is 0, okay, but log of 10 would equal what? Okay, and a to the first is equal to a, right? So 10 to the first is equal to 10, right? Correspondingly, what's the logarithm base 10 of 10? 1. Okay, um, and again, just so we're, we're clear, if I don't put a decoration underneath the log, what's the assumption? Base 10, okay, uh, with the exception of when we do this in Mathematica, in which case it'll be the natural log, but that's, that's just a computer uh, thing, okay. Um, okay, good, yeah. Um, and then, obviously, as the powers get bigger, then the numbers do too, right? So what's log of 100? Well, how do I want to think of 100? It'd be 2 because I want to think of 100 as 10 squared, right? So what's log of 10 squared, according to this rule, it'd be 2 times the log of 10. What's the log of 10? 1. So we'd get two times one, which last time I checked was two. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, now, the thing that's sort of a trap with logarithms is you guys are going to make, there are, so those are the rules I wrote up, right? Log of A times B is the sum of the logs. What's log of A plus B? All right. So what is this? What are you tempted to write here? Yeah, is that true? No, it's wrong. I'm sorry, I can only ever say that the way Cartman says it. Or, or maybe we can do Mr. Mackey, right? That's bad, okay? Don't write that, because it's bad. Um, okay, uh, right, so, again, don't do math at three in the morning, because you will mess, mess this sort of thing up, okay? Um, okay, so um, the last thing I wanted to do was just kind of review a, a quick bit of the sort of basic right triangle trigonometry. Okay, um, and so if I take a right triangle, and let me give it that, and let me put an angle over there, okay, 
uh, and, and I say that this is a right triangle, okay? Uh, then we can define six trig functions, which is to say, let me just define three to start with because the other three are just reciprocals, okay? What is the sine of theta in this triangle? Yeah, it's which one? Opposite over hypotenuse would be whatever A over C is, okay? And now how do you remember the what's the, the kind of mnemonic for this? Sokotoa, right. Right? So sine is opposite over hypotenuse. Cosine is what? Adjacent over hypotenuse. And tangent is, oops, opposite, that looks like an E. Let me fix that. Um, opposite, which is A, over adjacent, which is B. Okay. Um, you'll notice that the tangent, by the way, is the slope, right? Because if, uh, what's the slope of the hypotenuse here? It'd be A divided by B because that's rise over run. Well, that happens to be the tangent, okay, which is kind of handy. Um, okay, so we remember that from, like, you guys, well, probably saw this in geometry first, but then later when you redid trig and pre-calc or however you, you did it. Uh, yeah? And Arthur, you have two? Yeah, okay. Um, all right, now, there's three other ones. What are the other three trig functions? Secant, cosecant, and cotangent. And what are those in terms of sine, cosine, and tangent? So what is secant? It's one over cosine. What is cosecant? One over sine. And what is cotangent? One over tangent. Okay. Uh, so you just flip them over. That's it. Uh, and you might ask, why do we have such things? Uh, there's there's some good historical reasons, but uh, they're handy. To. So, but they're just reciprocals, right? So as long as you can figure out sine, cosine, and tangent, the other three are easy. Uh, and in fact, if you know sine and cosine, can you get tangent? How? Right. So sine divided by cosine is tangent. Okay. Um, Right, so, and, and it turns out, right, if you know just sine, you can usually figure out cosine using some identities. Um, but point being, uh, you've got that, okay? So, um, because what is true about uh, the relationship between sine and cosine? Okay, so for example, If I take sine squared and I add cosine squared, what would I get here? I get a squared over over c squared plus b squared over c squared, and that would equal a squared plus b squared over c squared. Well, what is a squared plus b squared in this right triangle? It, uh, sorry, a squared plus b squared just the entire quantity, what's that equal to? I'll take C squared. Why? Yeah, because Pythagoras. Okay, and what's C squared divided by C squared? One, right? So if you take sine squared and add cosine squared, you always get one. That means that you can solve for one in terms of the other uh, with one minor detail that we'll talk about in a moment. Okay, do uh, so you guys remember that, right? Basically, this just comes down to Pythagoras' theorem. Okay, um, I'm out of room on this sheet. Do you guys mind, but let me know when I can go on to the next sheet. Put your hand on your head when you're ready for me to move on. And now hop up and down on one foot and rub your, no. Good? Okay. So, 
let's take an example. Okay. All right, so let's suppose that we're given the situation where we know the cosine, but we don't know the angle. Okay, And I also know that the tangent or one of the other uh, functions, I know whether it's positive or negative. Okay, Now, what this will do is allow me to figure out the following. What quadrant is the degree of the angle theta? What does it have to be in? For this to be this situation to be true and it's got to be in one of the four quadrants right because the circle but which one well we got four guesses huh which one first one okay which is the first quadrant by the way the top right okay what's true about x and y coordinates here they're both positive, and sine is positive, and cosine is positive, and tangent is positive. Everybody's positive there. But if tangent's negative, can we be here? Nope. Okay, so that rules out this one. Okay. What's positive here? Okay. Sine is positive here. Tangent is positive here. And cosine is positive here. Okay, or a way to abbreviate this. Um, did anybody see it written that way when you were in high school? Okay, ASTC, all suckers take calculus, or A smart trig class, or when I was in graduate school, I also worked with high school kids over the summer, and they taught me a really cute one, which I love. Alvin Simon Theodore Chipmunks. Yeah, I thought that was real cute. So, uh, right. Okay, so if we have a positive cosine, which two quadrants could that happen in? One and four. But tangent's negative, so it has to be four. Okay, does that make sense? All right, and just to keep everybody on their toes, how do we label the quadrants? Uh, I've always done it in Roman numerals, but you could just use regular numbers if you want. Uh, that's the order uh, because, um, you know, in math, we start zero over at the right and go counterclockwise because all of our clocks clearly do that. Yeah, isn't that great? The clocks go backwards from how they do in math. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Um, okay. So we've established that what's true about which quadrant are we in, for sure. We're in four. Okay. So if I draw an angle in quadrant four, it would look something like this, right? And if I know that the cosine is four, what do I know about the x length and the hypotenuse? I know that they have to be that, right? Because what is cosine? Adjacent over hypotenuse, okay? Um, do they have to be four and eight or could, or sorry, four and uh, five, or could they be eight and 10? It could be eight and 10, do I know? No. Well, because all I know is that the ratio of them is 4 to 5, so let me just make it 4 and 5 because, well, let's start there. Okay, Okay. now, if I want to know what sine of theta is, what do I need to do to get that third side of the triangle? Pythagoras' theorem, okay? And so what is the y-coordinate here? I'm going to say negative 3 because it's below the axis. Okay. So fair point, if I thought of the length of that segment as being uh, given by Pythagoras' theorem, then what is the length of that thing? 
it'd be three, correct? So I'm gonna write a minus three there, but what I really mean is what are the coordinates of this point? It's at four comma minus three. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so the reason I'm gonna write it, uh, and I'm not saying that the length is negative, I'm just thinking of the negative three as being associated with that, is because what is the sine of the angle theta? It would be negative three over five, not three over five. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah, okay, so um, uh, yeah. Okay, so we remember that, no? Is it mystifying, Patrick, or? Yeah, okay. So, yeah, maybe better put is that um, you'll notice that I've played a trick here. Is this really the angle I'm talking about? No, really the angle is this thing, right? But uh, I can convert from one to the other, right? I'm, I'm being, well, I'm sweeping over, you know, an entire semester of trig class, okay? Um, so, anyway. Okay, so uh, we're out of time. What's the game plan for the next couple days? What do you have for tomorrow night? Okay, your first warm up for Friday. Okay, uh, what do you have due Sunday night? There's two review assignments over all the stuff that we talked about today. I split them into two, so there's an algebra one and a logarithms and trig one, uh, just to keep them kind of tidy. Uh, but those are just review things. Uh, what are we doing on Monday? Your first exam, okay, which will be basically over the review stuff, okay? Um, and what's due tonight? Which all but one of you have done. No, that's due Friday. Yeah, the Edfinity demo, okay? And so far, all of you have 26s out of it. One person has a 25 out of 26, and I don't know how the hell that happened considering it tells you the answer. And one person has a zero because they haven't done it yet. Okay, so get, get on top of it. And I will see you guys on Friday.